I would agree that there's not much instruction or knowledge of how to do that. And, uh, you know, in Gestalt, we talk about these three main modes of awareness, uh, the somatic, the sensory, and the cognitive, imaginative, everything that goes on with that. And I know... There's that, a fourth. And I know, yes, you propose a fourth, which I think is kind of significant because certainly in Gestalt, that's not really talked about. <clears throat> you introduced me to it and... Um, even if we talk about it, we don't quite know what to do with it, the biofield or... Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I, it feels like a field. Mm. Uh, it's more like a field. People talk about people's energy. It's To me, with my background in physics, it's more like a field. Uh, and uh, But it doesn't matter what it is. Are you aware of it? And are you aware of the information available in it? And if the answer to those two questions are no, you've got a lot to learn. Mm. That's all I would say. Mm. Uh, and if you think you're actually uh, practice, practicing interpersonal awareness, you're missing a whole dimension of it. Mm. You know, there are other things you might be very astute about. And then many practitioners are doing bits and pieces of what I'm talking about. They kind of fall into it or it breaks through, as you described this person say. Uh, it's, it's not something they've worked out that they need to, uh, it's something they need to do to allow that to happen. It doesn't just happen. They're allowing it to happen. Maybe only briefly. Sometimes I only do it briefly. It depends where I am and what's going on around me, whether I want the full input, so to speak. Mm. Now, you know, people might be listening to you and saying, well, that's interesting, and you claim that there's... But he's a nut case, yeah. Well, right. well, and you claim there's a way to do it and even a way possibly to teach it or there's some kind of methodology, even if it's to do with... Being willing to be ambiguous, but perhaps you could illustrate a ambivalent, little bit. Ambivalent. Ambivalent. Um, perhaps you could illustrate it a little bit with some examples so that people can get a more concrete sense of, you know, okay, what, okay, you gave the example on psychedelics of the key, but, you know, out of psychedelics. Oh, out of psychedelics, there are all kinds of examples. Yeah, so give a few so that people can understand what it is you're talking about and mm. how you do it and what does it look like. Well, uh, I mean, there are a whole bunch of them in my book. Mm. Uh, you know, The Way of a Seer, <laughs> still available on Amazon. <laughs> Commercial break. Yeah. Highly recommended, yes. Uh, so uh, what, what occurs to you right now, you know, that you sort of think, yeah. Well, well uh, you know, it's, you can walk in, uh, I remember when I was, uh, I was uh, living with this woman for a short time in London, and she was a very up-tempo person, very positive, very, you know, happy-go-lucky. And uh, I remember uh, I got back to her flat, which was right off Barclay Square, and she'd given me a key, and I went in, and she wasn't there. And as I walked into the living room, I was hit with the fact that she'd been thinking about suicide. And uh, because people leave an after image of themselves. I mean, I know that's not commonly believed. They leave a kind of field after image of themselves. And I was surprised because, you know, she was so uh, high energy dynamic. You know, she had been the youngest captain in the British Army, a youngest female captain in the British Army ever. And uh, she was very driven and, uh, and up-tempo. And when she got back, I asked her, she said, oh, yeah, she had a, you know, she occasionally has a real downer. I'd never seen this. And she would keep it hidden. But it's there to be perceived. She, she was feeling that way, and it left an image in the room. I mean, if I'd been sitting in the room, with her, it would have been much stronger. But it's always there. So when you use that kind of language, it's there, it almost sounds like a kind of a reification of something like no no that's not no, okay well, but then what when you say it's, it's there, there it's there uh, an imprint mm -hmm. is left behind mm -hmm. it's like if you you know uh if you walk through the mud outside and you leave footprints behind i say it's there it's like a footprint right so you're claiming a, a, a my perception actually is able to perceive those footprints because of the way i use my attention Right. You're saying, though, that there are footprints. There's something in, on some... Well, it's not, it's not a thing. Mm. Uh, you know, is an electron a thing? 
question. No, it's it's a cloud of probability, mm. and uh, and a moving electron uh, creates a field that can be detected, and I think human beings uh, have a kind of a biofield mm. that it, you know leaves. Uh, Markers of itself mm -hmm. uh, in the field around it. Mm -hmm. and uh, some stay for a long time. Like if there's a violent death in a place, it often stays for a long time. You can actually perceive it. Uh, I remember when I was also when I was living in England. A lot of these things I re relate to the way past living in England because uh, they were new for me at the time, and I you tend to remember the real new ones. A lot of this is kind of day-to-day -day stuff now, and it's like, uh, did you remember that sign on the road that when you were driving here, you know, near the corner of uh, the B60 and such and such? No, you wouldn't. And that's so the ones that uh, really were, oh wow, you know, that's an eye opener. Uh, I remember those the most. But on a daily basis, I could wake up and go, okay, I'm going to hear today that such and such is happening from somebody. And like the other day, I'm supposed to have a, an appointment with a cardiologist before I have surgery. And I've seen this guy many times. And I woke up that morning, I said, oh, it's gonna be canceled. And then two hours later, I get a call, it's canceled. Uh, Cause the guy's sick, he's at home, probably has COVID. Uh, and, uh, but that happens all the time, every day. It's just like a, a background. So of course, that sounds like crystal ball stuff. To... It's not, crystal ball is just a pejorative way of talking about something you don't understand that a lot of people fake doing and don't do. Mm. But some people are just doing that. Mm. And I'm not saying I have great control over it. I'm just, my attention is open to noticing mm. things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's... Those are, you know, then, then they are just, you know, small ones. You know, it's like the person says to you, they're smiling and they seem quite at ease. And they say, oh, they're feeling great. And you know, they're really deeply unhappy because you're not looking at their presentation. Uh, you're looking at the kind of, the quality of the field around them. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at it visually. I'm mm -hmm. actually feeling mm -hmm. the field around mm -hmm. them. How do I know how to do that? Well, I learned how to redeploy my attention for doing that. Well, this would be certainly of interest to many Gestalt people these days because there's a lot of talk about fields, psychopathological fields, fields of awareness, fields of context, the, the fields we're layered That's in. more abstract bullshit, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it is. Uh, I even hate to use the word field. I have to use something mm. when I talk to people. I generally don't talk about it. Mm. I've done a few interviews in the recent past because I'm 80 now, and I thought, well, I should say something about these things. Mm. Uh, I did write a book to say something about it, but uh, as usual with most books, no one's paying attention. You know, uh, what, I remember when I was doing my doctorate, the head of the department was a philosopher named Phil Almond. I liked him a lot. He was a good bloke. And, you know, uh, I read his book on the philosophy of mysticism, uh, and I really enjoyed it, and I went into his office and said, Phil, I read your book, I really enjoyed it. He said, oh great, now that's two of you who read it, you and my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully a few more people than that will, will be listening to this. So, yeah. okay, so you know, you're, you're talking about your actual experience, this <coughs> isn't just some mystical woo-woo thing, or, and, and you're saying- well, look, there's no supernatural, all right? Supernatural, anything that exists or we could perceive in the natural world is in some way natural because it's part of the universe we live in. Supernatural is like what uh, atomistic reductionists like to call uh, anything that violates their basic rules. They call it, oh, you, you believe in the supernatural. No, I don't. If you ask me, I will tell you, I'm not a theist, I'm not an atheist, and I'm not an agnostic. Okay, I'm not in that game. That's it. It just has no meaning to me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not a right winger. I'm not a left winger. I'm not a centrist. Uh, I'm trying to respond to what is as it is as I meet it. Mm. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, let's say with the voice to parliament, the you know the yes versus no vote. Uh, what I really believe is that giving the voice to parliament 
won't really help. However, according to polls, most Aboriginals, about 80%, want it. So therefore, I'll vote for it because that's what they want, and I want to give them something, you know, that that I can. And that's about, I haven't got a lot to give them, but that's about it. So you're kind of a pragmatic humanist. Pragmatic humanist, pragmatic phenomenologist, yeah, Mm -hmm. pragmatic. You like the pragmatism bit. Okay, so then maybe again, if you can say a few more things about the pragmatics, because, um, you know, people listening will still wonder, well, Okay, you claim to be able to do that, and yes, you know, the doctor did indeed cancel, so, you know, perhaps... That's a trivial thing. Okay, but, you know, but in terms of, you know, because sometimes people encounter these claims from a lot of people, and as you say... A lot of people mm, talk this talk. mm. Uh, They don't use my vocabulary, thank God, (laughs) or they have to change it. But there are a lot of people who try to build self-esteem and ego selves on these kinds of phenomena. Mm. And... One of the w- reasons that a lot of what they think they perceive is not true is because they uh, don't know how to differentiate what is their own projection from what they're receiving. Uh, they're so used to receiving their own projections, where in effect, everyone is a mirror for them, mm-hmm. that uh, they come to believe that all those reflections are really they're seeing the world. It's a bit like Plato's cave, but instead of, you know, fires burning behind the people casting shadows on the wall, they're just, you know, it's mirrors. Well, indeed, Fritz Pills did say something like that. He said, uh, we, we, uh, we think we live in a house of windows, but in fact, it's a house of mirrors. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, Pearls never realized how to get out from behind his mirror, you know. <laughs> uh, but But look, you know, I'm one of the few people I know alive who witnessed Pearl's work firsthand. And I can tell you, he was doing some of this because he'd get to uh, underlying process so fast that it wasn't necessary for him to go through all the stuff that people need to tell most therapists for them to get it. He didn't need that. And he was doing something. But Pearl's was also a cruel egotist. And that's what made him a shit, mm. you know, uh, but a talented shit, okay? Mm, indeed. So, um, so just getting back to you and the pragmatics, because I want to yeah, keep coming back to that, because I think that the, the more that you can illustrate it, the more this makes sense. Um, so can you say a couple more things about the how? Okay, you've said something about horizontalization, looking at things unfamiliar, suspending, you know, beliefs, moving from away from top down to... Okay, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example, an exercise I give people all the time. I say, uh, let's say you're doing something visual or you're having some anxiety and thinking in your head. I want you, if you can remember to, to pause and listen to the background sounds around you. There are always background sounds around you. Even if it's the tinnitus in your ears that you weren't noticing, you'll notice sounds. Now, there's something you do when you do that. First of all, you're switching sense modalities. So you're suspending one, and then there's a very brief pause as you turn your attention to the sounds around you. And that moment of pause, of turning your attention to the sounds around you, is the place, pragmatically, where uh, the kind of perception I'm talking about takes place. Right there. For most people, when you first do that exercise, that passes very quickly. But there, if you start to notice that paused moment, uh, then, and at that moment too, you then hear things you weren't hearing. They were there, but you weren't hearing them. Uh, then if you can maintain that the quality of that pause, the silence, I call it the silence of that pause, and bring it back to whatever you were doing before, whether you were ruminating on some anxiety issue or you were just, you know, doing some task, it will look different. English all terms almost like switching figure and ground, but it's the emphasis is not just on the switching, it's on slowing down the process of switching because something happens in the transition. That's that's right. So the figure and ground thing is good, but uh, it just as like, switching sense modality is good, but it's done to actually get you to notice the in-between bit Mm. when you're moving 
so you're suspending something mm. in a very profound way that if you could stay suspended or if you could learn to just do the suspension, which is what I've learned to do, is and that's the real, what I would call the real epoche, mm. where you suspend that way and let the world come into you and, or the person you're talking to or the thing you're doing or the uh, lizard crawling across your garden. Yeah. So isn't that a little, little bit like the hypnagogic state where you're moving from wake to sleep and it's in between? Well, you're, you're doing an in-between thing there and, and it, it, it may be related. And I used to use the hypnagogic state a lot. Like before a client would show up, I'd go into hypnagogic state and I'd already have part of the session because I do some fundamental things about that person who was coming. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a way, it's, I found it's a more difficult way to open it that what I really had to do is learn how to just open it. What am I doing when I'm making that move across sense modalities or back from the hypnagogic state into normal consciousness? What am I doing? That's the question. Uh, and so I ask what I'm doing and I try to study what I'm actually doing, what I'm, what I'm, how I'm using my attention, what, what do I do to get into that state? What's, what's the quality of it? How do I move into it? And that only can be answered internally for yourself. You have to kind of map it out in yourself and see what you're doing and then learn to do it. See if you could just make it happen. Are there certain markers that you can articulate in your own process around that? Oh, well, the marker will be, you'll notice how, you know, it's, it's like everything. One of the markers you first notice is that uh, everything seems more three-dimensional. And this is what you get on, on mescaline immediately when you take it. Everything seems more three-dimensional. Colors seem more intense. And, and they don't necessarily happen in this order or this way, but uh, aspects of perception just jump out more. Uh, someone's, let's say, someone's tone of voice, all of a sudden, it's just very different. It's much more penetrating or makes you, you know, notice it more. Uh, it's just a whole lot of things like that. They all of a sudden, again, it's not like trying to switch figure ground. It's like the ground just jumps up because you've opened the door to it mm -hmm. and, and it just appears. Mm. Morgan Goodlander talks about emergent ground, something emerges from right. it. Right, you, you open the door for it to emerge and it emerges. Uh, it's, it, if you wait for something to do it to you, it won't happen. You have to, but you can't make it happen. You have to learn how to suspend. Mm. Suspending is the key. And that little exercise is a way of learning that suspension. Although I'm sure there are other ways to learn it. That's just what I taught people at one time. Well, I mean, Stan Groff, you know, for instance, does the breathing thing. I Different think, thing. You don't think that that produces an altered state, which maybe... Oh, it does produce an altered state, but it produces uh, much too much turbulence. Right. Mm. You know, Stan, Stan Groff is, you know, uh, he's a guru. He's into turbulence. <laughs> <laughs> Excitement, right. Getting people, you know, really into something. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really care, actually. Uh, I met him a couple times at conferences. He loves himself. <laughs>